as we were just getting psyched to move into the real-time ray tracing era with releases utilizing DirectX 12 ray tracing and Vulkan ray tracing, Crytek dropped a bombshell demo, showing off an API and hardware agnostic ray tracing. Fast forward a half a year later, and that demo has now been released, with Crytek kindly providing us with a press version of the demo before release, so we can take its visuals under the microscope and talk about its performance. To get right to the heart of it, this demo utilizes DirectX 11 and requires no specific ray tracing hardware. Rather, this version of ray traced reflections leverages Crytek's already long in development and mature sparse voxel octree global illumination, which I have showed off in a few videos in the past. This so-called Sfogi is a version of ray tracing that utilizes a simplified version of the scene that can generate diffuse lighting, and it can be traced into with a technique called cone tracing to give glossy reflections. It has its limitations though. It can have trouble capturing moving and animated objects, and those reflections done will not be pixel accurate. So this is where Neon Noir comes in. On top of the information from voxel cone tracing and cube maps, Neon Noir also injects ray traced specular reflections of geometry on top. This geometric ray tracing handles moving objects like the flying drone in the demo and allows for pixel accurate reflections, including self reflections. So you can see cool stuff like the drone in the demo reflecting its own rotor wings in its body. Not bad. As mentioned, this is not utilizing DXR or Vulkan ray tracing, so it cannot utilize any of the benefits of that API, so it can't use Turing's hardware acceleration to make it run faster. At the same time, it has a benefit of sorts by being able to mix scene representations, so further reflections from the camera can be done with a more cheaper voxel cone tracing. It can basically mix triangle ray tracing and voxel tracing. If this were running on DXR or VKRT at the moment, then hardware acceleration would only accelerate that triangle tracing part of the reflections. Since it is running on compute shaders and DX11, that means it will work on any more modern GPU out there basically. But as we know from our own testings with games like Battlefield 5 or Quake 2 RTX, the more total ray tracing is, the more rays that are used, the more realistic the effects are, or the more they take up on screen, that means performance will crumble on GPUs that lack hardware acceleration. So how does this demo maintain performance on non-hardware accelerated GPUs? Neon Noir utilizes a number of smart shortcuts to maintain performance that are important to mention. The first of which is the distance at which objects made of triangles are actually ray traced, which in the demo is a bit limited. The limited distance of triangle ray traced reflections is most obvious in longer shots, like at the end of the demo as the camera pans down the street. Here you can see, for example, the sign ray traced reflection being added in as the camera gets closer. So objects further away in the distance will have their reflections handled by cube maps or by voxel cone tracing, leaving them decidedly less detailed and less dynamic. A second area of optimization occurs with the type of reflections that can be represented. Surfaces that are more rough, but still reflective, do not get ray traced reflections on them. Like here in this specific shot, if you look at the area where the ground meets the darkened wall, you can see how there's really no reflection there. In reality, we would expect the edge of the building to also be reflected on the ground here, but it is a rather rough surface. And the rougher a reflection is in ray tracing, the more expensive it is to render, and it's also hard to make it not look super noisy if you do trace it. Only mirror-like reflections are maintained in this demo to keep performance up. This is kind of similar how Battlefield 5's low and medium settings work, which also limit reflections to more mirror-like surfaces. Another optimization is how certain objects are traced by utilizing lower polygonal versions of the objects. Probably best seen in those areas where the camera gets really close to an object, like looking at these shell casings on the ground here. If you look, you can see how the shell casings are much less rounded in the reflection than the actual model is. This saves on performance. 
Another less obvious optimization is how recursive reflections are handled. That is, reflections of reflections, or reflections in reflections. As far as I can tell in this demo, reflections in reflections, like in Battlefield 5, are just cube maps. But honestly, that is super expensive anyway, even with hardware ray tracing. The last area of more obvious optimization comes from the resolution at which the ray traced reflections are rendered at. From my pixel counting at the alter settings for ray traced reflections, they seem to render at quarter screen resolution. So at 4K, those ray traced reflections would be 1080p. The very high setting for ray traced reflections in the demo below the ultra setting seems to render them at an even lower resolution of at either 1 7th or 1 8th screen resolution, but it's pretty hard to count considering they're so heavily filtered. Also that very high setting seems to have a higher apparent roughness cutoff than the ultra setting, meaning that those surfaces that are a bit rougher do not get ray traced reflections, like here in this scene where it looks like Ultra has the more rough street reflection reflecting the frame of the mirror. But on high, that same reflection of the mirror's frame is missing. And the final kind of optimization is how the scene itself is authored. A closed street with only a handful of moving objects. From talking with developers and reading presentations about ray tracing in real time, we know that updating the scene representation for animated or moving objects every frame can be quite expensive in its own right, so this scene only having a handful of them probably makes it lighter on the GPU. In spite of all these optimizations, the demo looks rather awesome in motion though, especially on the ultra setting for RT reflections. The environment made for the demo is a wonderful showcase of the power of having ray traced reflections for off screen surfaces. Really all those neon signs and reflections in puddles look excellent, and the best part is that they do not disappear when the camera moves, which would definitely happen with screen space reflections. Speaking of screen space reflections, our press version also had the ability to toggle screen space reflections being layered over ray trace reflections by editing a config file. While the performance was decidedly worse with the setting set on, it did show some interesting benefits in certain shots. Take the scene I mentioned earlier, where the roughness cutoff was missing ray trace reflections since they would be rather expensive. By adding in screen space reflections on top of RT reflections, that discontinuity in reflections for this surface and at this angle can at least be remedied as the SSR and Cry engine can also apply to rougher surfaces like this. Of course with all those caveats that screen space reflections have. But it wasn't a panacea, other shots showed inaccuracies when you added SSR on top, like this one in the ending alley where this hazy reflection looks rather strange if you turn SSR on. So it's not a blanket win, especially if you consider how it's much more expensive if you add SSR on top. Neon War looks excellent, and thanks to all those clever optimizations, it runs rather well. Thanks to my colleague Richard Ledbetter, we were able to make rather extensive tests for a swath of GPUs at both ultra and very high settings at 1440p. Looking at the latest NVIDIA offerings in the mid to upper range GPUs at 1440p with ray traced reflections set to ultra, the RTX 2070 Super and the RTX 2060 Super managed to hang around the 60fps line for most of the demo, but with the RTX 2060 under that being beneath the 60fps line. The biggest dips occur in those instances as the screen fills with the reflection surface. This dips into the high 30s on the RTX 2060, with the Super version in the low 40s, and the 2070 Super being in the high 40s. If you add in the higher enthusiast GPUs from Nvidia into that mix, then you will see at 1440p that the RTX 2080 Super manages very close to being above 60fps for the entire demo, excluding that one portion as we get near the shells, where it dips slightly below 60fps. The RTX 2080 Ti here barely breaks a sweat really, and teeters near the 120fps line multiple times, and even crests over it. This is all without any hardware acceleration mind you, which would make a demo such as this one even faster on such GPUs. Going over to similarly classed AMD offering tells a similar yet different story. 
Starting at the mid-range versus Nvidia's nearest offerings in terms of rasterization performance, it is possible to see how at ultra ray tracing at 1440p, the RDNA architecture seems to have a harder time processing the specifics of this hardware agnostic styled ray tracing. Usually we would see these pairings of GPUs being neck and neck on average across a number of titles in normal rasterization scenarios, but here Turing seems better fit for this workload somehow. As I say that though, we have to remind ourselves that we're looking at ray tracing on GPUs here which are not running on dedicated silicon. The fact that an RX 5700 XT and RX 5700 are even putting out above 30 FPS throughout the demo is excellent performance in my mind, given what's happening on screen and what's happening behind the scenes. This is real time ray tracing and reflections are especially not computationally simple, so larger Turing cards fare better than similarly performing RDNA cards in this given workload. But what about cards running on GCN architecture? As we know, GCN is very much so anchored around its compute performance in comparison to the more game-oriented real-world performance that RDNA showcases. So how do different AMD architectures handle this hardware agnostic ray tracing? In the case of GCN, not too well. Where CryEngine in the past has shown a love for GCN, here the ray tracing workload on the RX 5700XT is performing a bit more than 9% faster than the Radeon 7 so a turn of tables from what we usually expect. Going down to the older GCN offerings in the Vega series of cards shows an incremental drop of performance depending upon core frequency and the amount of compute units, with Vega 64 performing 17% worse than Radeon 7 and Vega 56 performing 25% worse than Radeon 7. So in spite of its compute performance dominance, GCN architecture seems less adept at this type of workload than RDNA, and most definitely less so in comparison to Turing. Pascal shows a similar story to GCN here, although to a lessened degree. Cards which usually perform similar to each other show larger differences than in rasterized titles here in this benchmark, even without RT cores being used. Looking at one of the harder to render scenes in the benchmarks with the shell casings, the GTX 1080 Ti finds itself 19% less performant than its newer cousin in the RTX 2070 Super. Going down the chain, we can see that the GTX 1080 is 38% slower than the RTX 2070 Super. Even Turing's lower end offering without RT cores in the form of the GTX 1660 Ti, which usually competes with the GTX 1070, is moving up the totem pole towards GTX 1080 performance here in this demo. This GPU performs better in this demo in comparison to the GTX 1080 than we usually see in most games. Looking across the aisle from Pascal to GCN, usual contenders in the Vega 64 end up being slower on average than we usually expect in comparison to their Pascal alternatives. Here Vega 64 managed to be 11% slower than the GTX 1080. Going down even lower into the older mid-range, the GTX 1060 and the RX 580 are really not good enough for ultra settings at 1440p here but dropping down ray tracing to very high, we can see a more appreciable spread. Whereas we usually see the GTX 1060 being trounced by the RX 590, and definitely even also by the RX 580, the GTX 1060 here manages at these very high ray tracing settings to hold its own against the two, and even showing pretty great performance in those tougher scenarios where reflections fill the screen. Nonetheless, even with very high settings for RT reflections in this demo, cards of this caliber are just below spec at 1440p, as the FPS is really too variable. Only the GTX 1660 here manages more acceptable performance as I see it. Where it is usually compared with the RX 590, it manages to perform quite a lot better. Dropping down ray tracing to very high in general has a staggered difference across architectures. Larger Turing saw around a 15% uptick in performance, as represented in the RTX 2070 Super, while RDNA saw a larger, near 90% performance uptick by utilizing the very high setting over Ultra. Looking at older architectures, Pascal, as represented by the GTX 1080, sees a performance increase of around 18% when going from Ultra to very high ray tracing. 
GCN, as represented through Vegas 64 here, sees a performance increase of around 24% when utilizing very high ray tracing over Ultra. In summation, it would appear that certain architectures are more suited for this style of ray tracing. Here Turing's at the top, a wash between Pascal and RDNA architectures, and then GCN is at the bottom. And as dropping the ray tracing to very high shows, the worse the GPU architecture is at this style of ray tracing, the more it benefits by limiting the amount of rays shot out and limiting the resolution of ray tracing itself. So GCN sees the greatest gains and Turing sees the lowest. These are curious results in the end that make me wonder about the future of ray tracing in general across these architectures. How will RDNA perform such tasks in the future when it does get ray tracing hardware support in RDNA 2.0? Or how will it perform on the consoles? The API method and driver will be different there, of course, though, so there's maybe not too much that we can actually project from these results. In terms of CryEngine supporting these type of ray trace reflections right now, I'm super excited. And according to Crytek itself, it can be extended to support near-field ambient occlusion and shadows even, which really bodes well for that Crisis remaster I hope they are currently working on. Or perhaps that's just in my dreams. In the near term though, I really would like to see this technology ported over to DirectX 12 ray tracing or Vulkan ray tracing so that it can even run faster and so that it is prepared for the inevitable hardware accelerated future for ray tracing. Until then, I hope you enjoyed this video, and you really should download the Neon Noir demo to test it out on your PC. It looks great. If you did like this video, then please hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. If you are already a subscriber, then please consider hitting that little bell in the corner to be informed as soon as Digital Foundry posts a video. If you want to talk to me about Neon Noir or my dream of the Crisis Remaster, then write a comment to me below or follow me and Digital Foundry on Twitter. And as always, this is Alex, bidding you farewell und auf Wiedersehen.